Hello and a very good evening. You're watching the news tonight on Rajya Sabha Television with me, Frank Pereira. Here are the headlines. Election Commission announces poll dates for Tripura, Meghalaya and Nagaland, all three 60-member houses to vote in single phase in February. Model code of conduct takes effect. Twenty-fifth GST Council meeting concludes in Delhi. Rates revised for 29 goods and 53 categories of services. Many handicraft items not to attract any tax. New changes applicable from January 25th. On the last leg of his six-day visit, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu meets top Indian CEOs and addresses business summit, pays tributes to 2611 attack victims in Mumbai. And Supreme Court gives go-ahead for the release of Sanjay Leela Bansali's film Padmavat stays the ban, order and notification issued by four states, Madhya Pradesh, Haryana, Rajasthan and Gujarat. Well, the GST Council approved rate changes for 29 goods and 53 categories of services on Thursday. The revised rates will be applicable from January 25th. Rates on LPG for household domestic consumers by private LPG players, scientific and technical instruments have been reduced from 15% to 5%. GST rates on drinking water packed in 20 litres bottle, biodiesel and drip irrigation system have been reduced from 18% to 12%. Vibhuti, parts of hearing aids and de-oiled rice bran have been placed under the nil category and many handicraft items will also not attract any tax to protect jobs in the handmade industry. Rates on cigarette filter rods have been increased from 12% to 18%. Finance Minister Arun Jaitley also said there was a general consensus on simplifying the return filing process where GSTR 3B will continue, but a final decision would be taken in the next council meet. GST provision requiring uh, transporters to carry an electronic way bill or e-way bill when moving goods of over 50,000 rupees in value between states will be implemented from February 1st. In the services, there were some categories which were actually explanatory in nature. So these uh, 29 goods and eventually 53 categories of services were accepted and the new rates for these will all come into force from the 25th of uh, January. Well, Union Finance Minister Arun Jaitley chaired a meeting with finance ministers of all states and union territories in the national capital on Thursday. During the meeting, state finance ministers presented their wish list for budget 2018-19. Finance Minister Jaitley assured that uh, suggestions made by states and union territories would be suitably considered while formulating the final budget proposal. Emphasizing that the spirit of cooperative federalism would be encouraged and maintained, Jaitley said the memorandum jointly submitted by states and union territories would be given due weightage. Well, the Election Commission of India has announced single-phase elections to assemblies of Tripura, Meghalaya and Nagaland in February. All three states have 60-member houses. They are among the eight states that are going to polls this year. The Election Commission announcement brings into effect the model code of conduct in all three states from today. I will be faster, I will not take the Election Commission of India announced the polling schedule for three northeastern states, Tripura, Meghalaya and Nagaland on Thursday. The three northeast states are among eight in the country that will go to polls in 2018. Tripura will vote on February 18th, while Meghalaya and Nagaland will go to polls on February 27th. First round uh, Tripura elections would be held. Gazette notification 24 January 18. Last date of nomination 31st January. Scrutiny would be on 1st February 18. Uh, withdrawal of candidate is up to 3rd February 18, Saturday. And date of polling would be 18th uh, February 2018. Meghalaya and Nagaland. Uh, Gazette notification would be issued on 31st January, that is uh, Wednesday. Last date for nominations is 7th February 18, which is also Wednesday. Scrutiny would take place on 
8th February that is uh, Thursday and last date for withdrawal of candidature would be 12th February 18 which would be Monday. The date of polling would be 27th February that is Tuesday. The election commission also said that VVPAT will be used along with EVMs during polling in all three states. With the announcement of poll dates, the model code of conduct has also come into force. Uh, in order to facilitate uh, and ensure the secrecy of voting, uh, the height of the voting compartment has been increased from 24 inch to 13 inch. Uh, that was done in uh, earlier elections also. Uh, we are continuing with these three state elections also. Uh, as far as uh, electronic voting machines are concerned and uh, voter verifiable paper audit trail that is VVPAT, uh, the VVPAT, EVMs and VVPAT shall be used uh, in all the polling stations in the three states of Meghalaya, Nagaland and Tripura. The counting of votes for all the three states will be held on 3rd March. The tenure of Meghalaya, Nagaland and Tripura assemblies expire on March 6th, March 13 and March 14, 2018 respectively. All three states have 60 seats each. The Meghalaya Assembly is currently led by the Congress, which won 29 seats in the previous election. Tripura, on the other hand, is under a CPIM government. The Naga People's Front is at the helm of the 60-member Nagaland Assembly. Bureau Report, Raja Sabha Television. Well, on the last leg of his six-day visit to India, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had a packed schedule in Mumbai. The day started with a power breakfast with Netanyahu meeting top Indian CEOs and head honchos. It was followed by the India-Israel Business uh, Summit, where Netanyahu emphasized uh, that his country's partnership with India was doing wonders. Netanyahu also laid a wreath at the memorial of 2611 terror attack victims at Taj Hotel in Mumbai and met 11-year-old Moshe Holzberg, whose parents were killed in the 2008 attack. Here's a detailed report. On the last leg of his six-day India visit, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was in Mumbai on Thursday. His day began with a power breakfast with the country's top business leaders at the iconic Taj Hotel. Top industrialists, businessmen and top banking officials including Ajay Piramal, Rahul Bajaj, Ardi Godrej, Harsh Goenka, Anand Mahindra, Dilip Sangvi, Ashok Hinduja, Atul Punj and Chanda Kochar were in attendance. During his interaction with the business leaders, Netanyahu said the partnership between Israel and India was doing wonders. I will say beyond the, beyond that, the, the partnership between Israel uh, and India is wonders. After the breakfast, Netanyahu addressed the India-Israel business summit at the same venue, saying that India and Israel are two innovation nations that must come together to seize the future. Maharashtra Chief Minister Devendra Farnavis also attended the summit. The future belongs to those who innovate. Israel is an innovation nation. India is an innovation nation. We must be innovation nations to seize the future. If we don't, we'll fall back. If we do, we'll define the future. We can do so better together. Netanyahu also hailed the strong bond that he shares with Prime Minister Narendra Modi. After the summit, Farnavis hosted a lunch for Netanyahu and his delegation, which was followed by a wreath-laying ceremony at the 2611 Memorial at Marine Lines and paid tribute to the victims of the 2008 terror attack. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu then visited Nariman House, where he met 11-year-old Moshe Holzberg, the then 2-year-old who survived the 2611 attack at Hobad House in South Mumbai. His parents were gunned down on that fateful night. In the evening, Netanyahu met around 30 members of the Jewish community at the Taj Hotel. There are about 5,000 Jews in India, most of who call Mumbai their home. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. Well, Indian shares posted a record closing high on Thursday as a rally in global markets boosted sentiment. Benchmark Sensex rose over 178 points to hit new closing high of 35,260.29 while the broader NSE Nifty ended above 10,800 for the first time. Markets got a boost on reports that the government is considering raising the foreign investment ceiling in private banks to 100% and in public sector lenders to 49%. Sustained FII inflows and fresh spell of buying by domestic institutional investors has kept the momentum going for Indian shares.
Besides optimism over encouraging Q3 earnings by some more companies and upcoming budget to bolster trading sentiments accelerating buying by investors. Foreign investors have been supporting the ongoing rally by pumping sizable funds into domestic markets. Well, moving on to some other news now. At a time when Pakistan is getting isolated on the issue of terrorism, Russia has openly backed Pakistan, calling it a victim of terrorism. The assertion by Russian Deputy Foreign Minister Igor Morgulov at the ongoing Raisina dialogue in Delhi has thrown up a new debate on the changing geopolitical scenario in the subcontinent. Russia looking at a strategic opportunity of a Russia-China-Pakistan grouping versus U.S. Stating that Russia has provided helicopters to Pakistan in its fight against terrorists, Russian Deputy Foreign Minister Igor Morgulov on Thursday claimed that it is a victim of terrorism. We provide support to uh, Pakistan to improve its uh, counterterrorism capabilities. We uh, several helicopters to Afghanistan uh, to Pakistan I'm sorry to help them to to fight uh, they uh, and, and to help them to provide to, to uh, have their own uh, counter-terrorist operations you know that uh, Pakistan is also suffering from terrorist attacks the statement was countered by Zalme Mamozi Khalilzad a former US ambassador to Afghanistan Iraq Russia and the UN uh, that uh, uh, while the U.S. is trying to pr pressurize Pakistan, India, see, uh, in, uh, uh, and pa India supports us and others, Russia is seeing an opportunity uh, to take advantage of that uh, Pakistan's potential isolation. India has already expressed concern at the open support to Pakistan by China and its supply of helicopters by it. What is Pakistan facing today? It's facing results of this support to extremism that it jumped in for. And more it supports extremism, more the dangers of going down. Uh, Russia is basically signaling, uh, trying to signal its own displeasure or concerns about the growing US-India uh, partnership and the recognition, as I've just mentioned, of India as a major defense partner. Uh, and they think that this is a direct challenge to the India-Russia defense partnership. Expressing a different view, former Afghan President Hamid Karzai said, although 90% of Pakistan's weapons are still American, Russian involvement could throw open a new dimension altogether. Russia is an important factor uh, in, our, in our region. And the Russian influence uh, towards bringing a solution to um, the question of terrorism is, is, is a welcome one, and, and, and we hope they will do all they can to, to bring us to that. Russia is our oldest ally, and we have to have concerted talks with Russia on these issues. In changing geopolitics, such type of irritants come, but we have to resolve it through consistent talks. Akhile Soman for Raj Sawa Television with camera person Pasanto in Delhi. Moving on, now the Supreme Court has given a green signal for the All India release of Sanjay Leela Bansali's film Padmavat. The Supreme Court stayed the notification and order issued by four states, Madhya Pradesh, Haryana, Rajasthan and Gujarat, banning the release of the film. The Apex Court also restrained the rest of the states from issuing any such order. In its interim order, the court said all states are constitutionally obliged to maintain law and order and prevent any untoward incident during the screening of the film after permission has been granted by the Central Board of Film Certification. On Wednesday, a petition was filed in the Supreme Court challenging the ban imposed on the film. The movie is slated for a January 25th release. अन्य उच्च ने सर्वोच्च न्यायालय ने कोई निर्णय किया है तो निर्णय की समीक्षा हम लोग करेंगे जो लायन ऑर्डर की स्थिति है उसकी समीक्षा करेंगे और उसके बाद जो उचित निर्णय है वो सरकार करेगी न्यूज़ फ्रॉम कश्मीर नाउ इन द लेटेस्ट सीरीज ऑफ इंसिडेंट्स इन द स्टेट अ बॉर्डर सिक्योरिटी फोर्स जवान वाज मार्टर्ड एज पाकिस्तानी ट्रूप्स वायलेटेड द सीज फायर by firing and shelling along the international border in R.S. Pura sector on Wednesday. A 17-year-old girl was also killed in a ceasefire violation by the Pakistani troops. According to the BSF, the firing and shelling on the border outposts and civilian areas in R.S. Pura sector started at 9 p.m. on Wednesday. Three civilians have also suffered injuries in the heavy firing and mortar shelling by Pakistan. 
Meanwhile, the Director General of Border Security Post, K.K. Sharma, has described the situation along the line of control and international border in Jammu and Kashmir as tense. He said that they retaliated effectively to Pakistan's ceasefire violation in R.S. Pura sector. Siti tense कह सकते हैं. L.C. पे भी लगातार ceasefire violation हो रही है और अब I.B. पे भी पाकिस्तान की ओर से ceasefire violation की गई है तो हम इसे tense city कह सकते हैं. We have already taken special measures. We are already prepared for उनकी तरफ से infiltration की कोशिश होती है उसको रोकने के लिए हम पूरी तरह से तैयार हैं. उनकी तरफ से ceasefire violation होती है. We are ready, more than prepared. To meet any challenge. Well, it's time for a short break now, but news and updates will continue on the other side. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. Prolific British poet and story writer Joseph Rudyard Kipling, one of the first masters of short stories in English. In 1894 appeared his Jungle Book, which became a children's classic all over the world. Kim, the story of Kimball O'Hara and his adventures in the Himalayas, is perhaps his most felicitous work published. Set in and concerned with India, he had come to know and love so well. In 1907, Kipling became the first English language writer to receive the Nobel Prize for Literature. Welcome back. You're watching Rajasabha Television. Well, the NIA filed a charge sheet against 12 individuals, including Lashkar e Toiba chief Hafiz Saeed and Hizbul Mujahideen head Syed Salahuddin on Thursday. The charge sheet relates to alleged funding of terror and sessionist activities in Jammu and Kashmir. The NIA also named Syed Ali Shah Gilani and uh, Bashir Ahmad Butt, businessmen Zaroor Ahmad, Shah Watali and photojournalist Kamran Yusuf who has been identified along with Javed Ahmad Butt as a stone pelter. It also charged Hafiz Saeed and Syed Salahuddin along with 10 others for criminal conspiracy, sedition and under stringent provisions of the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. The NIA filed a 12,794-page charge sheet along with an extra before a designated court in the national capital and sought permission to continue its probe related to terror funding in the state. According to the NIA, the case was registered on May 30, 2017 and the first arrests made on July 24 last year. The agency said that during the course of investigation, its teams conducted searches at over 60 locations spread across Jammu and Kashmir, Haryana and Delhi and seized over 950 incriminating documents and over 600 electronic devices. Over 300 witnesses were examined during the probe. The agency has recorded confessional statements on the flow of money, especially from Pakistan, from four people accused in a case related to the funding of terror activities in Kashmir. Well, India today successfully test-fired its nuclear-capable surface-to-surface ballistic missile Agni-5 from a test range of Odisha coast. It is the most advanced missile in the Agni series with a strike range of over 5,000 kilometers. Well, the test flight has further boosted indigenous missile capabilities and deterrent strength of the country. All radars, tracking systems and range stations monitored the flight performance. The missile reportedly travelled for 19 minutes and covered 4,900 kilometres. The sleek missile was test-fired from a canister launcher mounted on a mobile platform at about 9.54 am from number 4 launch pad of the integrated test range in Abdul Kalam Island. Agni-5 is the most advanced missile in the Agni series with new technologies incorporated in it in terms of navigation and guidance, warhead and engine. It also has advantages of higher reliability, longer shelf life, less maintenance and enhanced mobility. Meanwhile, President Ramnath Kovind hailed the achievement on Twitter. Well, Vice President M. Venkaya Naidu today exhorted uh, India's exporters to focus on new markets and new products, addressing the exporters after conferring FIEO Exports Excellence Awards 2018 in Chennai. The Vice President uh, said that they must pay attention to products. 
which show higher growth in global trade including electric, electronic and telecommunication equipment. The Vice President added that government's Make in India initiative to support India's manufacturing sector together with its focus on infrastructure growth and multiple initiatives for boosting domestic demand will further strengthen the economy. He further said policy decisions like demonetization and GST will have a positive impact on the economy in the coming years and that the government was ready to address problems faced by exporters. Friends, what I am suggesting is that we must find out what are the other avenues of exports where our imports have become less and exports become more. We should think on those lines. There is no depth of knowledge and talent here. The Make in India, the Skill India, the Digital India, the Clean India, the CDC program, or the Stand Up, or the Start Up. All these programs are aimed at releasing the forces of growth, unleashing the forces of the growth among the people. Well, here's a roundup of some more news from across the country and nationwide. Punjab Chief Minister Captain Amarinder Singh has accepted the resignation of Power and Irrigation Minister Rana Gurjeet Singh from the state's Council of Ministers. The Chief Minister confirmed the news after meeting Congress President Rahul Gandhi in the national capital on Thursday. The Chief Minister will now forward Rana Gurjeet's resignation to the Governor. The principal of a school in Dakna where a class 1 boy was allegedly attacked with a sharp-edged weapon by a girl six years his senior has been arrested. Police says that the suspect wanted a holiday in the event of a schoolmate's death. Meanwhile, Uttar Pradesh Chief Minister Yogi Adityanath visited the trauma centre in Lucknow to inquire about the well-being of the six-year-old child. The boy is stated to be out of danger. The incident took place on January 16th. Karthi Chidambaram appeared before the Enforcement Directorate in connection with its probe into the INX Media money laundering case. Karthi was summoned by the agency to appear before the investigating officer of the case on Thursday. His authorised representative had met the I.O. on the last two occasions with the Central Probe Agency, subsequently asking him to appear in person. The Central Probe Agency had registered a case against him and others in May last year. Moving on to some international news now, 52 Uzbek nationals were charged to death after a bus caught fire in northwestern Kazakhstan. The accident took place in the Irgiz district of Aktobe region while the bus was travelling along the samara Shaimkent route. Only five people managed to survive. The route is frequently used by Uzbek migrant labourers travelling to construction sites in Russia. It is unclear what caused the blaze. Officials said the blaze spread very quickly through the bus and uh, Icarus model made in Hungary. The buses are still used in former Soviet uh, nations and are often decades old. Well, here's a roundup of some other news from around the world in Global Buzz. Myanmar has asked Bangladesh to extradite over 1,300 Rohingyas suspected of taking part in a rebel assault against government checkpoints in Rakhine State last August. The incident led to a violent military operation in Myanmar against the alleged insurgents, forcing over 6 lakh people in the Muslim Rohingya minority to flee to neighbouring Bangladesh. British lawmakers voted in favour of the government's legislative blueprint for Brexit, marking a victory for Prime Minister Theresa May over political opponents who want a softer approach to leaving the European Union. The European Union bill was approved by a 324 to 295 vote in the 650-seat lower house. The bill repeals the 1972 law that made Britain a member of the EU and transfers EU laws into British ones. US President Donald Trump has said Russia is helping North Korea to get supplies in violation of international sanctions and that Pyongyang is getting closer every day to being able to deliver a long-range missile to the United States. Trump said that Russia is not helping them at all with what China is helping them. Trump also cast doubts on whether talks with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un will be useful and praised China for its efforts to restrict oil and coal supplies to the North.
Well, moving on to news from the Australian Open now, where unseeded Indian pair of Leander Pays and Pura Raja started their Australian Open campaign on a winning note in the men's doubles event. Pays and Raja defeated uh, Georgian Austrian pair of Nikolaus uh, Basilashvili and uh, Andreas Heather Moir 6 2 6 3 to enter the second round. The Indian duo will next face Britain's Jamie Murray and Brazil's Bruno Suarez. While another Indian in the fray, Rohan Bopanna, also kicked off his campaign with a win along with his French partner, Edouard Roger Vasselin. Bopanna and Roger Vasselin defeated American Canadian duo of Ryan Harrison and uh, Vasek Pospisil. 6-2, 7-6. Meanwhile, in the men's singles uh, draw, Julian Benetou of France uh, shattered David Goffin's Australian Open hopes after defeating him 1-6, 7-6, 6-1, 7-6. in another match, six-times champion Novak Djokovic of Serbia beat Gail Monfields of France for 6-6-3, 6-1, 6-3 6 to reach the third round. Meanwhile, in the women's singles draw, third-seeded Garbin Muguruza of Spain lost to her Taiwanese rival Shea Su Wei, 7-6, 6-4 in the second round. In another match, Russia's Maria Shoropova defeated a Latvian opponent Anastasia Savastova, 6-1, 7-6 to reach the third round. <laughs> well, here are some more updates from the world of sports and sports beat. The Indian cricket team captain Virat Kohli was named World Cricketer of the Year at the ICC Annual Awards announced in Dubai. This was the second time that Kohli won the award, having won it earlier in 2012. Kohli also bagged the top honour among ODI players. In the qualification period from 21st September 2016 to the end of last year, Kohli scored 2,203 runs in 18 tests. He also 1,818 runs in 31 ODIs. In 2020s, Kohli made 299 runs at a strike rate of 153 in 10 matches. Well, the Indian men's hockey team lost to Belgium 0-2 in their second round-robin match of the double-leg Four Nations Invitational Tournament in New Zealand. Arthur D. Sluwer and Victor Wenges were among the goal scorers for Belgium. On Wednesday, India defeated Japan 6-0 in the opening match. India will next face hosts New Zealand in their final round-robin match of the first leg on Saturday. Zimbabwe won a thriller ODI match against Sri Lanka by 12 runs at the Sheri Banglas National Stadium. Batting first, Zimbabwe scored 290 runs in their innings. Sikandar Raza was the top scorer for the Zimbabwean side with his unbeaten 81-run knock. While opener Hamilton Masakadza scored 73. Chasing the target, Sri Lanka were all out for 278. Tendai Chatara was the pick of the bowlers for Zimbabwe as he took four wickets. Lionel Messi missed a penalty as Barcelona's 29 match unbeaten streak ended in a 1 0 loss to Espanyol in the first leg of their Copa del Rey quarter final. Messi missed the penalty in the 62nd minute after goalkeeper Diego Lopez saved his spot kick. Oscar Melendo scored the only goal of the game in the 88th minute, which helped Espanyol seal the victory. Well, that's it on this newscast. Good night.